Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Just wanted to uh, have you join along inshallah. So if you're watching along, say salam. Let us know where you're watching from inshallah. And we'll get started soon with our host. Allahumma barik ya Rabbi. So uh, let us know where you're watching from inshallah, where you're viewing from, where you're coming in from. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joins us always in good. Let me know if the sound is coming through well as well inshallah. I hope everything is um, good on your end. Alhamdulillah, we see people uh, saying salam from different places. we got London in the house with our brother Umar. Hamdani, jazallah khair, salamu alaykum. And of course, we're hosted by our dear friends from Malaysia, mashallah, on uh, other streams. We've got people from England and other places. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. All right, Sister Asa, I'll turn it to you. You can uh, lead the discussion. We'll get started when you're ready, inshallah. So for... All right. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen. Sayyidina wa Nabiyina wa Habibina Muhammadin. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim kathim and kathira. We always begin by sending our prayers of peace upon our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are fortunate to receive the shafa'ah, the intercession and the dua of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment, that by the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of accepting the little deeds that we perform <laughs> in this life, that we are fortunate enough to earn the mercy of Allah again, and that it shows itself in our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam counting us amongst his followers. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from those who are able, insha'Allah, to pass through um, uh, the, the numerous difficulties that we experience in life so that we can find a place and a time to be nearer to Allah Azza wa Jal 
in our commitment and in our worship of him. I first wish to acknowledge uh, my dear sister, Jazahullah Khair, uh, Sister Munira, and um, the family, Jazahullah Khair, for inviting me along and asking me uh, to hold, uh, you know, a, a Malaysian family discussion, mashallah. So uh, it's always uh, wonderful to connect with my dear brothers and sisters uh, in Malaysia in particular, but also beyond. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to have our hearts gathered together in this life, but that we gather together also in our commitment and in our submission to the way and the tradition and the sunnah of the Prophet So the topic that was chosen by our dear sister uh, was balancing work, home, and ibadah. And I wanted to begin with the word balance first. It's a very important word that shows itself often in the Quran. <clears throat> now the concept of balance for us as Muslims is the concept of remaining upon istiqamah. So really, uh, the best translation for the word istiqamah uh, of being upright. You, think, you know, when we translate mustaqim, uh, we say, oh Allah, make us those who are upright. Qa'im uh, or qiyam is to be standing. So mustaqim is standing but in a balanced way, that you're not leaning to the right, you're not leaning to the left, you're not going off one side and you're not let negligent in the other. <clears throat> it becomes important uh, for you and I to then consider, it becomes important for you and I to consider in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing, uh, I'm seeing some of the comments saying that there's a little bit of noise. Let me know if that's still there inshallah. Uh, uh, one of the issues that relates to istiqama is for us to remain not just upright, but also balanced in the middle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah that one of the descriptions in Surah Al-Imran, in different places in the Qur'an, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا I destined you to be an ummah that is rightly balanced in the middle that you are upon a middle course, we are upon a middle path, we are in a way that is not going to the right, not going to the left, not going beyond the limit set or the balance that has been made for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So balance becomes really important. When we speak about balance, we're speaking about three important types of balance. The first type of balance is that we remain upright even when the conditions around us change. So it's easy if you and I are standing on firm ground to remain standing upright. The ground isn't shaking. It's not moving. I'm not going to tip over because the carpet has been pulled from under my feet. I'm on solid ground. But what happens, of course, in life is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that as happened with the prophets before us, the companions of the prophets before us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, I cause the earth between beneath them to shake. And the dua of the Prophet has always been Rabbana Thabbit Aqdamana Wansurna al Qawm al Kafirin. Oh Allah, keep our feet firm. What is this thabat? Keep our feet firm, meaning that when life shakes, when illness occurs, when loss of uh, income happens, when there's a loved one who is unwell, when the circumstances in life are not the way we want them to be, we always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us firmness and steadfastness and uprightness. The second type of balance <clears throat> is that if we see ourselves going off to one side, that we learn that we need to throw our weight to the other side to counterbalance it. So if you have fallen into an error, the way to counteract it is to do more good deeds that cancel out the sins. So Allah teaches us about counterbalancing in life by saying, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Your good deeds are what cancel out, change, eliminate, extinguish, wipe out, erase your sinful deeds. ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَى لِلذَّاكِرِينَ that is a reminder for those who wish to remember. And therefore, this is something that's a constant memory that you and I should have. We should always come back to this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you and I to know that we will make mistakes. We will go over one side. We will be either too far or too negligent in different issues in life. 
What's important is to remember to come back to the other perspective. That if you went into error, the canceling of the error is to do good deeds in its place. And the Prophet ﷺ says to Mu'adh ibn Jabal in the famous hadith, وَأَتْبِعِ Follow up your mistake with a good deed. The good deed will cancel out the sin. The third type of balance that is important is credit and debit. Sometimes we're spending more than we're earning. Sometimes we're spending people's love for us more than we're earning love and respect through them. Sometimes we're burning each other out by asking of others what we are not willing to give, by requesting from others what we are not providing, by being negligent in our dealings with others while expecting them to be complete in their dealings with us. And of course, life is not meant like that. You cannot be a person who's a taker and expect others to just simply give, 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 give. You must be a person who is willing to give as much as you are willing to take. And the more you give is better than to be somebody who is taking from others. And all of us, of course, we have had this interaction with somebody who is wanting to receive more than they are willing to give. And Allah speaks in particular about households and families and loved ones where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says between a husband and wife, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. That they are like garments to you as you are garments to them. To them is what you request of them. That there is an equity and a parity and a completeness in our relationship so that there is no imbalance and power struggles that are unnecessary in the households and in the relationships that we seek to make more positive than negative. So that word balance becomes really important. In fact, it is the first dua you make in the Quran. You say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Oh Allah, lead us, guide us to the straight path, the balanced path. الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ is the path that لا إفراط ولا تفريط, uh, ولا تفريط. It isn't something where you are excessive or negligent. It is in one where you are taking more than giving. It is in one where you are falling down rather than being upright and standing at attention for the needs of others. So balance is the essence of our faith. As a Muslim, your aim is to find balance. Your aim is to find equity. Your aim is to find justice. How do you define justice for us as Muslims? What is hikmah for a Muslim? It's wad'u shay'i fi mahalli, to put everything in its place, not to go too far, not to speak too much, not to be too shy, not to be too conservative, overly conser hyper conservative, don't go too extreme, but not to be negligent, that you forget that you forget the obligations and the necessities that has been ordered upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So balance becomes a, a, a major issue. It's interesting to note that in the title, you know, we immediately began by speaking about work, balancing work, home, and ibadah. And it's it's interesting kind of noting that usually ibadah comes at the end and work comes at the beginning, right? And I could see Sister Munira, mashallah, she's uh, amused by this. It's it's obviously not her uh, not her intent, but it's a good segue to kind of understand that Allah says this in the Quran. You know, Allah subhanahu wa taala He speaks to us about our pursuit as being something that is a primary objective in our life. We do become distracted by trying to gather our wealth, by trying to go out to work and earn in, in halal. We're not speaking, you know, it's not a bad thing. But don't let it come that it is out of balance, that it becomes a distraction to your life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَالْبَنِينَ وَالْقَنَاطِيرِ الْمُقَنْطَرَةِ These are beautified things in life. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Kahf, which we recited today in the first, in the ninth verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا That I built and I created this earth so that it is a source of beauty. لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ so that they will be tested by the beauty. And I want you to kind of think, uh, you know, anything beautiful in your life becomes your test. Anything you esteem, anything you hold in value, that is going to be your greatest test in life. Because those are the things that you must counteract the imbalance, the desire to get more, 
to go further, to delve deeper, to hoard for yourself what others may not be able <coughs> to access. And therefore, work is an important... The Prophet ﷺ says in authentic hadith, Al-amalu ibadah. Being engaged in work to earn that which is lawful so that you can spend it upon your home and your family and keep them in that which is lawful is something that is um, a beautiful thing. It is something that is ibadah. It is an act of worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be from those who are worshipping Him in that sense, that we are cognizant of our relationship with Allah, that we are careful in our dealings, and you, what you do for work and how you approach your work environment is literally something that ensures your longevity as a believer or can become a source of detriment and hardship for you in life. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from being of those who are negligent in life. Allahumma ameen, towards others. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not test us and make our fitna in the matters that are um, of our deen. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assists us in all that is good and all that is worthy and worthwhile of our love and our fidelity in our relationships with each other. So work is one of those things that can become a major distraction in life. It can lead us down a good path or it can become a problem for us if we invest ourselves in it at the detriment and at the uh, and at the um, at the expense of other things that we should have balance in it. Um, work, of course, is something that is subjective and varied between one person and another. And there are there is a difference between work where you are working for an income and work where it's something that you are earning as uh, an act of volunteerism towards others. Amal is always something that requires energy and anything that you put energy towards is considered amal within our <coughs> capacity as Muslims. The greatest amal is the one that profits you in the next life as well as this life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقُلِ اعْمَلُوا Say to them, work. فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ Allah is witness of what it is that you do, what you bring into creation from your deeds, from your sweat, from your energy, from your action, from your movement, from your thoughts, right? You are ordered by Allah to work. <clears throat> and when people ask the Prophet ﷺ, they said, Ya Rasulullah, if everything's kind of decided, why should we do anything? The Prophet ﷺ simply says, everybody will do what is written for them. So if you sit there and do nothing, then, then you're just fulfilling that as your aim in life. You, you, that's, that's who you are. You're not somebody who's ambitious, who's willing to go out. Uh, I heard something um, from Al Imam al Shafi'i and Al Imam Malik. Uh, now, I'm speaking to a Malaysian audience, mashallah, through Zoom with our sister. So you have to quote Al-Imam al-Shafi'i every so often, mashallah. So Al-Imam al-Shafi'i, <clears throat> he was the student of Imam Malik. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i was mentored by the great Imam of Ahl sunnah the Imam of Al-Madina. La yufta wa malikum fil Madina. Nobody could speak and give a religious instruction and edict and verdict if Malik is there and present to be able to answer. So Imam al-Shafi'i and Imam Malik, and this is something that uh, you know I received today as, a, as an Instagram message from our brother Ammar al-Shukri. May Allah reward him for it. Um, he translated uh, this discussion between Imam Malik and Imam al-Shafi'i. Al Imam Malik and Imam al-Shafi'i, they were discussing one of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ narrated by Imam al-Tirmidhi, where the Prophet ﷺ said, لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ if you trusted Allah and had resilience in your reliance upon Allah, the way birds have a resilience and a reliance upon Allah, they go out in the morning seeking the rizq from Allah and they never come home except that their stomach is full. There's always something that has given them something good, something blessed in their life. Al-Imam Malik, he interpreted that whether you go out or not, Allah will provide your rizq no matter where you are. Al Imam al Shafi'i interprets the hadith in the opposite direction. He says, no, the birds actually put in the work. 
they go out, they fly out in search of food. So Allah gives them the tawfiq to get what it is that they need. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i then wanted to demonstrate his knowledge to Al-Imam Malik. So he went out to the field. He climbed up one of the trees. He brought down a bushel of its dates. He put in the energy to earn a day's work. He was out in the farm. He came back home and gives Al-Imam Malik. He says, I went out and Allah gave me the rizq of earning this income. I earned these dates. And therefore, I, you know, like the birds, I have to go out and work to receive it. And then he ate one date. And then Al-Imam Malik, he took one date from him and ate it. And he said, also me, Allah sent my rizq to me, although I didn't work for it. And both wajh of the hadith are valid. Both understandings are valid. We take that from a, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where, and I want you to kind of think about this hadith in whatever work capacity you're going to do, and whatever is going to engage you in life, memorize this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, لو أن ابن آدم يهرب من رزقه كما يهرب من الموت لأصابه رزقه قبل موته. If a human being, if the son of Adam, tried to escape the rizq Allah set for them. If you try to get away from receiving what Allah has said you will have, your rizq will arrive to you before your death, even though you try to escape it the way you try to escape death. All of us, we try to escape. We eat so that we live. We drink so that we remain hydrated. We go to the doctor when we're ill. We try to look after ourselves and have a good, long, prosperous life. All of that is to escape death. And if we put in that same energy to try to escape our rizq, Allah will make us taste and receive our rizq before death arrives to us, which is inevitable. Your rizq is inevitable. And therefore, in your mind, my dear brother, I want you to know that work can be an act of ibadah if you are seeking that which is halal, so that you can fulfill the needs of yourself, your family, and others as an act of charity. It becomes not just halal for you, but it becomes an act of ibadah. And therefore, the balance of your work becomes a part of your niyyah. Number two, our home life. SubhanAllah, we have a volume and voluminous complaints, especially in our modern times. Bismillah. In our times, because of egalitarian kind of principles that have entered into Islamic societies and other modern economic systems where there is the expectation of a dual income. Husband and wife need to go out and earn. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted this. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقوم الساعة, The day of judgment shall not arrive حتى تخرج المرأة إلى السوق تعين زوجها until a woman is forced to leave her home to go out and work in the marketplace so that she can be in the assistance of her husband. Her husband is not able to meet the needs of the family on his own. Although it is meant to be a religious duty. It's a religious duty upon the husband to earn that which is within the economic means of the society you live in to sustain one's household, one's wife, one's children, one's father and mother and so on. But the Prophet ﷺ says the economic systems are going to change. People are going to need to have that dual. And there's precedent of the Quran of our sisters going out to work when there's a need in the two uh, daughters of what uh, is likely Shu'aib alayhi salam, uh, who one of them becomes the wife of Musa, Safura radiallahu anha wa rahmatullahi alayha, the wife of Musa alayha salam. Allah says in Surah Al-Qasas, فَوَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمُ امْرَأَتَانِ تَذُودَانِ He found amongst the people of Madian two women who had a large flock, قَالَ مَا خَطْبُكُمَا What's, what, Why are you here? قَالَتَا لَا نَسْقِي حَتَّى يُصْدِرَ الرِّعَاءِ وَأَبُونَا شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ We're not going to go and mix with these men. We can't take our flock until these people leave. And our father is an elder. He is not able to work. So we are the ones who are working. So we know from ancient times, from modern times, that the, the permissibility, the likelihood is there. And therefore, the work-home environment it has always been one that was meant to find balance in it in according to the means and what is necessary for the blessedness to permeate in the home. There is no ideal structure. There's no, uh, there's no lecture that I can give and say, this is the model you need to fill, fit in this circle. 
You need to be a part of this square. You have to fit in this. And that's it. That's the only way. You can work this many hours. You can do this kind of job. No. There are always going to be various different kind of considerations that every household has. It has its own secrets. It has its own needs. It has its own concerns. And it has its own um, elements of fulfillment. So the issue between work and home becomes a, a, a pinch point in many relationships, where on the one hand, there is the desire to be able to live comfortably. And yet, it's not meant to be at the expense of being with each other comfortably. And subhanAllah, when it comes to um, balance, the balance that is set, the teacher-totter that we are on, is what is best for the relationship and building the positive attitude and the positive relationships in the home. Most people, of course, that they are concerned with the lifestyle choices and they are concerned with what is more important. Do I really need um, that material level in my life? Do I really need to have a larger home than I live in? Do I need to upgrade my car or is it okay for another two years? How much of um, uh, a savings do we need? Uh, what are the type of uh, brands that we must have? That needs to be outweighed with the positivity of relationships and positive times and interactions that are found in the home. Third, we wanted to introduce the concept of ibadah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made our purpose in life clear. See, there are two words that are important, but people conflate together and they are not meant to be together. They are one as a byproduct of the other, but they're not the same. One of them is purpose and the other is meaning. What is the meaning of my life? Is what allows me to have purpose in my life. So when you sit and ponder, what is the meaning of my existence? Why am I here? What is the purpose of Yahya Ibrahim being a part of this world in this era? What is my role in my family, in my home, in my community, in my school, in my mosque, in my society, in my uh, extended family, in my... What, 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 what am I and who am I to them and to myself? And of course, you know, Shakespeare, to be or not to be, right? Uh, you know, Socrates and Plato, know thyself. What is the, per why am I here? What is the, what is, what is my meaning in this world? In that, in understanding your meaning, you then begin to develop your purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers both questions for us. He tells us that the purpose of our meaning of being here that you come to know which of us within us is living the best life that they can live, not in comparison to others. I return you to that ayah in Surah Al-Kahf. I've given them beauty in their life as a test for them the beauty that they experience is a test for them as to which will do the best of work with the beauty that they've been given, with the life that they've been given. So subhanAllah, what I have in life is not what you have in life. And I may, may be favored in one thing and you are favored in two other things. And there are things that I have that you are deprived from and many things you have that I'm deprived from. And I am not going to be judged in accordance to how I live my life compared to how you live your life because that which beautifies your life is different to that which beautifies my life. That which you have been given as a hurdle is different to what I have been given as a hurdle. And in your life, your test is how well you live with the life you've been given. This is how we understand some of those complex hadith that seemingly are easy to, you know, they, it's a, it seems like a short hadith, but it's so profound. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, that a woman of the night, may Allah protect all of our, our women, Allahumma Ameen, a woman who would give herself over for profit. She saw a dog on the side of the road that was panting from thirst, so she gave it water when other people walked by, didn't give it anything. 
فَشَكَرَ لَهَا On account of this, Allah showed her acceptance فَغَفَرَ لَهَا مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهَا And Allah forgave all of the sins of her past. I want you to pay attention to that. She gave water to an animal, to a dog on the side of a road. She's a woman who was committing the haram and zina and all these other things that we might describe. But that act of giving a dog water was enough to be thankful for the beauty she had seldom experienced in life. She had a life where she was abused as a young child. She escaped home and every man, every role model in her life took advantage of her. Every experience in her life was negative. The very far and, and, and short moments of beautification were small. That as a consequence of her redeeming herself, it was just a sip of water to an animal. Her life is judged by her measure, by her yardstick. Her success is in her life lived. Not in my life lived. And had, subhanAllah, she been given my life or your life, she would have exceeded, would have done better than the life you and I live. But she was given a life where the beauty of it was smaller or lesser or a different quality than the beauty you and I have. So when I miss a prayer, it's not like somebody else misses a prayer. When you have been given luxury and excess and you are not thankful to Allah, it is not like somebody who's been deprived and in poverty and in hardship who has not been as thankful to Allah as you. Everybody is in accordance to the means of the beautification and the ease and the discomforts that they've been given in life. And that becomes a very profound motivation for worship. I had one sister... Uh, in a counseling session. Bismillah. She said to me, Sheikh, my husband, I have to force him to pray. He doesn't pray any of the sunnah. He barely does the salawat. Barely, you know, I have to keep after him. And subhanAllah, I try to show a good example. I wake up for the night prayers. I try to wake him up. He doesn't wake up. Uh, he, he doesn't wake up. Subhanallah, the, 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 he doesn't want to wake up, doesn't want to fulfill the act of ibadah. He doesn't want to fulfill the good deeds that I'm doing. And I said to her sister, mashallah, may Allah increase you in good. May Allah allow you to continue to do your night prayers and to fast as you've said and all these wonderful things. But how do you know that his worship of Allah is not better than yours? What makes you assume that his worship has to be the type of worship you do? Maybe his patience in dealing with some of the mistakes you make is a better act of worship. Maybe his smile to somebody that he meets who is upset is an act of worship that can exceed some of the actions that you've done that are personal between you and Allah. Maybe his sadaqah that he has given at a time that he had need or that was something that you didn't fulfill, that you may have underestimated in amount but was done with a generous, generosity and spirit of heart, perhaps that is more accepted by Allah than the moment that you've made your, than the moment of your night prayers. What makes you assume that your ibadah has to be of the same kind as his ibadah. What makes you assume that their ibadah, which may be of a different nature, is not the same as something that is worthy of Allah's consideration? Uh, one of the great imams of the past, and this is a powerful, powerful statement, and I, I want you to kind of think about this statement of these great imams. Uh, it, it, it is meant to center you and I in a place where we can kind of think maturely about our place, our role, our attitude, and our existence in our relationship with Allah. Uh, one of the great imams of the Shafi'i Madhab is Al Imam Al Shirazi. And, you know, Al Imam Al Nawawi explains his, his book, Al Majmu'ah. Al Imam Al Shirazi. 
his son stayed awake with him at night and they were praying their salah. And everybody around them, all of the different homes around them, nobody woke up. You couldn't hear the Quran being recited in their homes. His son says to him, he said, Subhanallah, not even a single person woke up to pray two rak'ah at night. And his father, Al Imam, the great Imam, he said, It would have been better for you to remain asleep like them, my son, than for you to have spoken negatively about them. Subhanallah. All of your night, you thought you were worshipping Allah and doing your act of ibadah, and you ruined it by just that one word where you thought about others that their ibadah is not worthy of yours. Perhaps them being quiet and being and sleeping was better than you waking up and thinking your salah is more mert, virtuous, more of merit than other people. Al-Imam and the great Khalifa, the fifth of the Khulafa, as some people have referred to him, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great great grandson of Umar ibn al Khattab. He said, We lived in a time where the righteous people considered righteousness not that you fasted every day or that you prayed every night, but that you held your tongue from speaking about others in an ill way. It is better for a person to hold their tongue from speaking bad about others as an act of worship than to fast by day and pray by night. Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la. How far we have kind of strayed from these great important understandings of what it means to be a worshiper of Allah. So I wanted to speak about worship in the month of Ramadan as a conclusion of our session so we can leave a little bit of time for questions and answers inshallah. In the month of Ramadan, which is soon to come, you want to cover three types of worship, okay? Just to make it easier. One type that is known only to you and Allah, subhanAllah. I want you to kind of think of something that you can do, that you hold valuable, that nobody on the face of the earth other than you and Allah is aware of. Nobody but you on earth knows this act of ibadah except you. And it might be that you have a little bit of savings that you give from it in charity that your husband, your wife doesn't know. That your father, your mother are unaware. It might be that you prepare and buy a meal for someone and put it in the masjid or that you give the masjid for their iftar program. Nobody knows who you are. It's not a masjid you pray in and you send money into it so that nobody knows who you are. It might be that you join a charity program that you are giving a little bit of your sadaqah, that it goes to somebody who you will never meet. In the month of Ramadan, try to find an act of ibadah, an act of good, that it is secret and hidden and unknown, that even you yourself don't know. The Prophet wasallam he said, Seven types of people on the day of judgment who will be given shelter, shade, and protection by Allah. When there is no protection and shade except that which is given by Allah. And one of those seven types of people, a person who gives in sadaqah, biyamini, gives in charity with their right hand, and his left does not know how much. SubhanAllah, that even the purse doesn't know how much. Let there come a day where you just put your hand in your purse, hand in your pocket, and you put and you gave and you don't know how much. Leave it between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second act of worship you want to do is an act that is public, that invites others to good. SubhanAllah. Something that you do that is a public good deed, that others see it and it inspires them to follow you in that regard. This is one of the reasons where the Prophet ﷺ said, Man fattara sa'iman, the one who gives food for somebody who's fasting. Kana lahu mithlu ajri sa'im ghayra anna ajra sa'imi la yanqusu shay'a. The one who feeds a fasting person receives the reward of the one who is fasting while the one who is fasting does not lose any of their reward. Allahu Akbar. Right? You want to be of those who give charity sirran wa alaniya. Allah says in secret and silent, but also they give charity outwardly. 
that people see it and they become inspired. In the famous hadith of Imam Muslim, also there's versions in, in the Sahih of Al-Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba, who can give charity to help these poor people? فَأَتَ رَجُلْ A man came and he had just a small amount that he put to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, here Ya Rasul, this is what I have. And when people saw this man come forward in front of them and give, everybody ran home, brought things and came until there was a pile of charity. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ سَنَّ فِي الْإِسْنَابِ سُنَّةً حَسَنَةً The one who establishes a good tradition, a good act, and فَأَتْبَعَهُ فِيهَا And others follow them in it. They receive the reward of everyone who acted in their capacity in following them in that regard. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of them. Allahumma ameen. This is the reason خَيْرُكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ says, The best of you أَنْفَعُكُمْ لِلنَّاسِ is the one who is benefiting others. The Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ the best of you is the one who learns the Qur'an and teaches the Qur'an. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, ya Rabbal Alameen. Third act in the month of Ramadan, you want to do something for those who are near you, those who are in your family. Abraqu sadaqa the Prophet ﷺ said, the sadaqa that has the most barakah, the most value, the most blessing, the one that will return the greatest return on investment. Infaqu al-mar'i ala ahli. It's where a man spends on his family, on his wife, on his children, on his household, on his home. Subhanallah. It's a great act of valor and charity that you can give that it's something that within your household. When the ayah in Surah Ali Imran was revealed, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرُ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not attain righteousness until you are able to give and spend from the things you love the most. Abu Talha radiallahu anhu, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I have two gardens that are the things I love most in life. They are the things that I have the greatest value for. These are things that I, I, I love to spend, uh, to, to spend time in and I've looked after them. Oh Messenger of Allah, I give them in sadaqah. The Prophet ﷺ refused. He said, no, don't leave your wife and your children in need. Don't give all, all of your wealth, these uh, important assets in charity. He said, Ya Rasulullah, but I want to earn the reward of this ayah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, in, if there is no way around it, if you are going to give this charity, you, are, you must give this charity, then give this charity in the way that you distribute it amongst your family. Give your brothers, give your sons, give your daughters, give your wife, give your... Friend, give, give charity to those who are nearest to you, right? Because that will put love in the heart that will return on investment. I'll add a fourth. Do something for somebody far from you. And do something for somebody outside your locality, outside your place. And subhanAllah, uh, the month of Ramadan is meant to be a month where we feel in our heart connection to Allah but our hearts also connect to those who are disadvantaged in other parts and other places in the world, that our hearts become one. The Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith um, that we are an ummah. When one of our parts of the ummah is in pain, we feel the pain in another part. So when I see the condition of my dear brothers, the Rohingya people, when I see of the pain of my Ghazan people, when I see the pain of those who have been traumatized um, by the atrocities in any part of the world, as a Muslim, I feel its pain. As a human being, I feel its pain. And it then comes back towards me to want to do something to assist in that regard. So try to do something for those who are beyond you, further than you, and those who are you are able to leverage khayr for as much as you seek to do, to do for those who are, are near you. And I hope that this uh, short discussion on balance in our work, in our home, and in our act of ibadah is something that is of a good preparation for the month of Ramadan. Allahumma ameen. 
I'll look forward to some of the questions that can come through some of my social media streams where I'm streaming to, and also from our dear sister Munira, uh, Jazakallah Khair, who's hosting us on Zoom. May Allah accept from all of us, Allahumma Ameen. I turn you over to Sister Munira. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka tubu ilayk. On my social media, do send in your questions, inshallah. I will try to answer some of them along with the questions that come from Malaysia. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So. There you are, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, um, I have a question on uh, since most of us here are with uh, children, how do we make uh, Ramadan interesting and beneficial for young children and also teenagers? Um, one of the, and you mentioned this, uh, Jazakallah Khair, uh, I, I do have an online series called The Best Ramadan Ever, right? It's uh, an online um, kind of thing, and I believe that in it, the the three modules that I that I kind of set up intentionally. The one that you mentioned on speaking on Ramadan with children. Yes, one? yes. Uh, in 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 the module of the best Ramadan ever, uh, the, the you know it's uh, through my website yahyaibrahim.com, and you just go to video series, you'll find it. But I've divided into three modules where there is the philosophy of fasting. Why do we fast? And that becomes really important because a lot of young people, they have been brought up to know that we fast. And it's just a default. As a Muslim, this is what we do. Muslims fast. But it's important to kind of understand the conceptualization, the philosophical understanding of why we show our submission to Allah in that sense. What does it mean when we restrict food, when we restrict water, when we restrict our sexual energy from each other? What does it mean when we kind of hold ourselves back in that sense? Why is that something that is important for us to do? That becomes a really powerful kind of thing. And in that concept that relates to the, the philosophy of fasting, I kind of go through you know, the rationale of fasting. Why do we fast? Speaking about fasting to children the concept of delayed gratification, the world that we re- live in today is about instantaneous. You know, you just, you got to drop it like it's hot. You got to do it to the max. You got to get it while you can. You only live once. You, you know, it's now or never. This is the kind of marketing, uh, you know, material that's pushed upon us as human beings. But social psychologists, psychologists will tell you being able to delay gratification and hold on for something better is something that is very powerful. So teaching our children about being able to restrain themselves and to hold on to the last minute and that they can look forward to breaking the fast is a powerful, powerful teaching tool about sabr and musabara. Anticipating the reward from Allah, that we have a better day than the days we live in the dunya, fasting in the Quran and the understandings that relate to it, all of those are really kind of important topics that I believe are important. The, the, the second module is fasting with the Prophet ﷺ. What would it have been like if the Prophet ﷺ is fasting with you, right? And there's 30 different tips that I speak about acts of worship that the Prophet ﷺ did or things that he uh, stayed away from in the month of Ramadan. So do I, I do recommend it's a free it's a free module. You can just sign up for it and do the 30, 40 episodes. They're usually about two or three minutes at a time. And you can kind of, you know, the a variety of charities that you can give, uh, being thankful to Allah, finding Laylat al-Qadr, how to make sure you observe it, uh, establishing normal routines in life, increasing your istighfar, detoxing from non-essential things increasing your tawbah and return to Allah, being a leader in your family, motivating others to go beyond, reconnecting after hostility, making peace with those who you've had arguments with, forgiving yourself. Most people in the month of Ramadan, they forget yani, to ask Allah to forgive them, but they don't forgive themselves. They're still reliving the pain of their own mistakes, of their own sins. And Allah ghafoorun rahim, but you are not ghafoor rahim. You are holding yourself in a prison that you construct. You know, reading the Quran every day, falling in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, finding love with Allah. 
uh, praying Salatul Qiyam in the Jama'ah, in a Masjid or at home, uh, being an inspiration to others, perfecting your intention in Ramadan, increasing your fear of Allah, thinking of your neighbor and the food that they have, hoping for Allah's mercy, holding your tongue, ba- a tongue back from obscene language. All these are lists of things that become really important for you and I to kind of consider in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I do recommend that we make our children acquainted with the variety of good deeds that can be performed, that siyam is not, uh, uh, siyam can also be saum, that there's a difference between fasting out of obligation. Allah says, kutiba alaykum siyam, you have to make siyam, no food, no drink. And then there is saum, which is the voluntary aspects, fasting with the heart, Fasting with my eyes, fasting with my ears, with what I say, with the level of my voice, all of that becomes really important, inshallah. Speaking frankly to young people about siyam is the best way to kind of mood, motivate them towards the truth, inshallah. Um, So uh, the great Sahaba, they used to have a saying, Rahimallahum ri'in arifa qadra nafsa. Allah sends mercy upon the one who knows their limitations. So it becomes really important for you to be very real with yourself. Don't be so ambitious that you overwhelm yourself. And don't be negligent that you undersell and do not explore new opportunities and new and new processes and new initiatives and new jobs that you can fulfill. But being a person who is centered, that you're always putting your relationship with Allah and the relationship with your friends and family as being of greater value than the material. So devalue material, but value relationships and human interactions and the considerations that you have with other people. So always make it the intent in your mind and in your heart that that which is most important is building positive relationships. Because if you have positive relationships, everything else kind of falls into place. Your, your job life becomes a little bit better. Your chance of getting uh, you know more opportunities to do more good for yourself and others and to have progression in life, it, it begins to increase. So you want to make relationships the center of the focus of your uh, day-to-day experience rather than the accumulation and the the processes that keep us uh, busy. I also want to stress, there's a, a lot of people are busy but not productive. Like there's a lot of people, subhanAllah, oh, I'm, I'm so busy, I don't know, uh, coming and going and, uh, you know, uh, but when you look at the end of the day, well, what did I really do? How much did I really accomplish? What was, what's the sum of, of my day? Well, it wasn't really much. So busyness does not mean necessarily productivity. So finding declutter, finding a place where you can kind of uh, get certain tasks done. And there's certain, you know, there's certain practical things you could do. One of the ones that I've been trying to do lately is the two minute rule. I don't know if you've heard of this. Two minute rule is anything that takes two minutes to do, just do it. Don't think about it. So putting out the laundry, it takes two minutes. Just put it. Don't don't say, oh, I'll come back to it. Um, anything that takes two, making your bed, ironing a shirt. Oh, and no, I'm not going to wear this tomorrow, but it takes two minutes. Just do it today. Don't worry about tomorrow, right? So whatever takes two minutes, two to three minutes, don't delay it because it's something that stays on a list. But if you cross off so many things on that list because they just took two minutes washing, you know, instead of putting the dish in the in the in the in the in the sink, and then you have to come back and do it, you say, "Oh, I'm going to wait for two or three dishes, then I'll wash them all together." But it takes just two minutes to wash that dish. Wash the dish, right? 
that immediately is going to give you hours of leisure time that you never knew you had. Subhanallah. I've been trying to master it. I fail at times, but it is something that I do recommend, inshallah. Check. Sure. Uh, I think I can combine this question because uh, one of it I think mostly covered in your best Ramadan series, which is asking on factors which affect istiqamah. And another question related is how do we maintain our ibadah post Ramadan? You know how um, the families will definitely do jama'ah throughout the whole Ramadan, and the minute we are in shawal and poof, all gone. Yeah. So yeah, how do we maintain that um, ibadah and that uh, what, what I will say is don't already approach it with a defeatist mentality. Yani, subhanallah, we're already anticipating that we're going to lose the spirit after Ramadan. And it's natural to decline. It's natural because you're not fasting 30 more days. You're going to fast, inshallah, six days of shawwal. You're not fasting another 30. So there will definitely be a decline. And there's nothing wrong with the decline as long as you don't crash. There's nothing wrong that you've ascended, but then you plateau and then you're going to go down, but pull up, right? So the pulling up becomes a really important aspect of our training and of having spiritual mentors and uh, assigning up for classes and continuing buying Islamic books and maintaining a Quran regiment and maintaining two rak'ah before you sleep and making it four rak'ah and six rak'ah and maybe waking up earlier than Fajr by a minute or two. You know, just uh, it, it comes to strategic planning. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us in the month of Ramadan that we can overcome our own selves. Allahumma inna ala anfusina. Oh Allah, help us against the whisperings of our own souls and our own selves. Allahumma ameen. Thank you. Another question here is, um, sometimes we are so busy with work that we feel that we are neglecting our children. But at the same time, we are obliged to ensure that we are amana in the time that we spend during our working hours, especially when we are working from home. And, yeah. yeah. So what, what I will say... Um, is if you already feel, if like inside yourself, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am neglecting my children, then you need to be real with yourself. Yeah, yani that, that's the reality. You need to be real. You need to face, face that reality. If you're looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I'm not doing what I should be doing towards my children, then hold yourself accountable to that. Put... Put the checks in balance. And that's such a, uh, it's such a mature thing to be aware of. Like for you to know that this is something I'm negligent in, most people, they try to avoid that critique, that self-awareness. So if you are mature enough, mashallah, spiritual enough to recognize this is something I'm not doing justice to, then take avertive action. And it might be that you ask a maid over or you pay somebody to babysit. And it might mean that the money you're trying to earn, you don't keep all of it because you're spending it on somebody else. But what I'm saying to you is that might be better than you living with the consequence of that five years down the road. Because five years down the road, the neglect you show today is going to show its worst effect then. So be careful. If your heart is telling you, I'm not doing the right thing, take avertive action. Invite someone to help you or cut back your hours at work or, you know, re reshuffle the processes that you find yourself in. But certainly it should not be status quo. It should not just remain as everything is going to be okay. It'll work itself out. The biggest lies we tell are the ones we tell ourselves. You look at yourself and say, oh, inshallah, it'll be okay. And you know it's not going to be okay. You know you're not doing the right thing. Don't make that, you know, mistake of just lulling yourself into a sense of self-denial and not taking responsibility of, of, of that which is serious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support all of us. Allahumma ameen. Right. One last question and then maybe we can go to the question that you have on your Facebook. Do you have any specific dua for people that are afraid of what others think? When he, she wants to do the act of kindness publicly. As you know, we are living in this society where everybody has things to comment. So, but just now you were mentioning that when we do something and if we inspire others, inshallah, we'll get the pahala of that person too. 
but at the same time, you know, um, we have this evil eye and things like that. So any specific do are to help with this. And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that the majority of the evil eye is from a person against themselves. Most of the evil eye is you on yourself. You didn't say mashallah for something you accomplished. You assume that you're the one who did it. You forgot to thank those who helped you to get to it. Uh, we have this hyper uh, obsession with nazar and people are watching and this bad thing happened to me because I know she's always looking at me. She's always comparing herself to me. He's always wanting what I have. This isn't the reality in life. The reality in life, yes, we believe al ain haq. But most of it is us against ourselves. Number two is that there are simple protections taught to us by the Prophet ﷺ. The three qul should be recited in your morning and in your evenings when you wake up and when you sleep. Bismillah, tawakkaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah before you leave your home. Right? Ayatul kursi, when you wake up, ayatul kursi before you sleep, ayatul kursi after every salah. Right? The last two su the last two ayah of Surah Al Baqarah in your morning and in your evening, kafatu suffices you from all harm, from all, all folly. So if you have in your heart that Allah is your protector, khalas, don't worry and don't be hyper obsessive with oh, this person's looking, this person knows. Oh, Keep your focus with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ghalibun ala amri. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is manifest all over, over all affairs. If you are shackled by these thoughts, then you, wama qadarullah you didn't estimate Allah what he deserves of you to think of him. Right? Don't think of Allah that he's left you. Have your tawakkul upon Allah and take responsibility for yourself. So doing good deeds, we are, we are not doing it in a boastful way. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the dua of Ibrahim. Who's the one who built the Kaaba? Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's a major act of public ibadah that until now we acknowledge. How does Ibrahim make sure that this is accepted? He makes the dua. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'u al-alim. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept this from us. You are the one who sees and hears all things, knowing all things, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So put your trust in Allah. Don't worry in what people say good or bad about you. Do what you do. Walk your path. Enjoy the beauty of your life and know the test is your own and not others. Know the test is your own and not others. And haters can hate and keep moving along. We have, you know, in, in, in English we say haters can, are going to hate, right? You can't stop the haters. In Arabic we have another saying. The dogs bark, but the caravan continues walking. The caravan doesn't stop for the bark of a dog. Somebody, uh, you just keep going. The camel is not disturbed. The, cam the, the moon is not hurt by the howling of a hound, right? It doesn't, it doesn't uh, affect the good that is being done. May Allah accept from all of us. Allahumma ameen. Subhanallah, if each and every one of us was to stop for every criticism, for every look people give us, for every comment that we receive, no one would have any productivity, beginning with the Anbiya, beginning with our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah says to the Prophet, Inna kafayna kal I will suffice you against those who mock you and seek humiliation for you. You will have ascendancy. Inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar. The one who seeks this to dishonor you, he, they are the ones who will be brought lowly and miserable. May Allah give us ascendancy on account of our humility and our love for him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ameen. Maybe we can have a few questions from your side. Uh, if you have any more, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm, there's 70 or 80 comments. I do, I'm not going to go through all of them, inshallah. So I'll, I'll leave it for you to maybe take one more comment. I know we advertise just a one hour time. So if you have one more question, inshallah, we'll take one more before we conclude. Uh, I've read all on our chat. Anyone with question, you can unmute yourself and ask. So maybe what, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll make a couple of recommendations, inshallah, just to end our discussion. If I can invite you, inshallah, to... Um, to do join that uh, the best Ramadan ever or any other Ramadan program or any other Ramadan book to get ready for the month of Ramadan. 
But uh, my recommendation number two is to have a strategic plan for what it is that you want to accomplish, inshallah, in the upcoming month of Ramadan and kind of think what are the amounts of charity you want to give, where you want to give them. Uh, get sophisticated with your ibadah. Don't make your ibadah reactionary. Somebody tells you, let's go to the masjid. You say, okay, let's go to the masjid. No, plan out where you want to go, what surahs you want to read, where you're going to finish the juz, how many juz you're going to read a day, or which parts of a juz a day. You know, which day, which hours in the day um, do I have more free time when the children are still asleep and, you know, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit freer. You know, map out your route to success, your route to success, right? Map it out. Have a strategic plan. And finally, is be a Ramadan buddy to others. You know, uh, I know with COVID restrictions and things like that, I don't know how much uh, ease it, it is in different parts of the world. I know Toronto, they're going into lockdown today. My father was telling me, uh, I don't know what the conditions are in Malaysia. Alhamdulillah, we're blessed in Perth. We have tarawih prayers and there's a sense of normalcy within our communities in Australia. But outside, I know there are restrictions. So be a Ramadan buddy to somebody, even if it is virtual, even if it's through phone, even if it's just through dua, right? Even if it's just through mentorship where you are checking in on each other. How is your Ramadan? What is your plan? Which Jews are you in? How about we read together? How about this and that? You know, and there are, alhamdulillah, so many useful uh, uh, online outlets for you to be able to find good. I know, mashallah, Yaqeen Institute does a lot of good. Al Maghrib, mashallah, is doing a lot of good. Al Kawthar is doing a lot of good. There's so much good out there on my website, inshallah. There's a lot of good. Uh, you know, find things that are going to motivate you and keep you on the course. Increase your reading of the Quran, your listening of the Quran, and your practice of the teachings of the Quran. Uh, one of my students, they said, Sheikh, I'm going to read the whole Quran in the month of Ramadan in English. He said, Sheikh, uh, usually I read the whole Quran in Arabic. And I said, that's good. He said, but I'm going to also read in English. I want to finish it in English. I want to know more about its meaning. So make, you know, find something unique that you can do and share it with other people. Be a Ramadan buddy to others that you continue to motivate each other to al khair bi idnillahi ta'ala i wanted to thank you once again sister munira for organizing this time that we have together may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all of the brothers and sisters who are on your end and on your zoom may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success i look forward to doing this again inshallah with you at some point in time and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our uh, uh, ramadan that is upcoming Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. And may Allah have mercy upon those who have passed away between last Ramadan and this Ramadan. May Allah send light upon their grave. And may Allah give patience and sabr to their families uh, at their loss. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us in all of the decrees that we may receive from him, that we may seem to understand in a negative way when it is always positive for us if our hearts were able to see. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Inshallah, we'll um, have another session, inshallah, next time. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much for inviting me. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka tubu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum.